Seven four number thirty-two. Yeah. Thirty-two. Yeah. Oh, good. All right. So I, I love it uh, grading some of these things, and uh, somebody left a blank. You just said. Uh, oh, I said forty-two. Oh, forty-two. Okay. Well, real quick, in case forty-two isn't covering. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, hyperbolic trig functions. Now, if I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to make you remember the derivatives and integrals for inverse normal trig, I'm obviously not going to make you remember hyperbolic. When you're doing the homework, you have the book, so you can go back to the hyperbolic section. Hopefully your teacher didn't just totally skip it. I've heard that some teachers did, and uh, this is making me even more worried about future Calc 2s that I might teach. Uh, I'm going to have to have an entire two weeks devoted just filling in all the gaps people come in with. Um, so if your teacher did totally skip hyperbolic stuff, uh, I'm sorry. For, for them, for you. Um, so let's see. Seven point, which one? Four. So I got that out of my system. 42. So this one is in the rational functions section, the partial fraction stuff. This one here, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it, it gives you a suggestion, make a substitution to express this as a rational function. So um, this is sort of related in a way to one of the problems on the practice test. Uh, what, what kind of substitution could you make here? And this one's kind of cool. I want you to, once you see this, this happens so much, and this is why I put this in the practice test, because I want to make sure you're aware of what you're allowed to do. At this point, this has nothing to do with this problem. You with me? One about the right, yeah. But we're used to doing stuff like this now, or at least we've seen it, and we have varying degrees of comfortableness with this. But the one, I don't care how much you dislike or like this, the one really nice thing that everybody should agree with, I don't know if you noticed this, is that I don't have to do any, I, uh, uh, one third in front or any weird shit. I can just see what dx is directly. You kind of with me? I replace dx with, in this case, see if she can swear d theta. I just put that right in where dx is. There's no finagling. There's no backwards thinking. There's none of that. So here's something really, really cool for what you can do here. You can say, uh, the best thing I can really do is u is cube root of x. Let me rewrite that, x to the one third. Cool. Now this would so suck if you do du and you're like, I don't have all that crap in there that I need. So what I'm going to do is turn this thing around. If u is x to the one third, x is you. How do you undo a cube root? Cube. Right. If you solve for x, you'd have to cube both sides. Now why is this good? If you're like, that's the same thing, Jeff. Why is that good? Because now, what is dx? So you are so much more, there's so much more flexibility with u sub. And I've shown you some, and I've shown you something related to this, and now we've even seen this with, with trig sub. Trig sub is a very specific form of u sub. It uses functions, not just u's. It uses entire functions, tangent, secant, right? Uh, so I could turn that bad boy around, and now I know exactly what to replace dx with. And the whole point of u sub is you can't have any x stuff left. Everything's got to be now in terms of u, right? So a few of you guys still have x stuff left, and I love it when you take an x out of the integral. Don't do that. That's like, again, scratching a, a chalkboard. Careful, that should not be something you can do. Um, so how do I this get rewritten? I do this. I wouldn't even worry about the limits. If you like changing the limits, that's cool. Uh, what happens on the inside? Good. One plus u on the bottom. The dx is. That's insane. It just doesn't feel like we're allowed to do that. And of course we are. We're completely. We figured out what to replace this with, and we figured out what to replace this with in terms of u. It's exactly what u sub requires me to do. Yeah, so what can you do here? You got 
Careful. Yeah, long five, because this is a higher degree than that. It's If it was turned the other way around, that would kick a lot of ass. Yeah. Right? But it, it, Because then you can split it up at least. But it's not. Too bad. So don't split this up. That You can't do that. No, 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 no. Higher degree on the top, I long divide. So u plus 1 into 3u squared. Let's see what happens. Help me out here. I just taught my pre-calc students this this morning. Let's, well, let's, let's see what happens. we got zeros in here, but we're not going to get zeros on top yet. 3u. 3u squared. Plus 3u, and then you change the signs. Minus 3u. So u goes into minus 3u. Minus 3. You guys with me? You definitely should be able to handle uh, long division. Some of you guys might realize you could actually attack this with, with uh, synthetic division. Right? You guys remember synthetic division? Synthetic division really kicks ass. But this is fine. Let's keep going. So I got my minus 3. So I get minus 3u. Three minus 3. Change the signs. So I get plus 3 over u plus 1. Now that will be easy to integrate, right? Each piece of this is easy to integrate. This last piece will be ln. And then the last thing I do is bring back in what u is. Don't end with a u expression because it started with an x expression. And actually the last thing I have to do then is plug in my limits. Are you guys okay with that? You guys see that? Hard stuff is done. How do we know we're gonna like solve it? Like I don't know. Like when I did, I didn't know that I have to. So it's not. Don't look at it like I didn't know I have to. Look at that as now I know I can do that. And on the practice test, there's a problem. Q over x uh, minus one over Q over x plus one or something like that, right? On the practice test, yeah. if anybody looked at that, yes. yeah. it's a lot like this one here. Yeah. You can do the same exact thing that I just did. Right? So it, it's a, I mean, this is, you have to learn what you're allowed to do. And then the next level after that is learn when it makes sense to do those things. Does that make sense? You cannot categorize everything. And I know you want that to happen, but you can't. There are certain looks that'll tell you what you can try. U sub uh, directly doesn't really work here. U equals that, I, the derivative is not in there. But now I realize I can turn the U around and then it might work. Now what we just did won't always work. It won't. Right? If I had some extra X stuff hanging around, it might not get covered by one of those substitutions and everything has to be covered by the substitutions, right? So it's a matter of getting used to what you're allowed to do. And then you get used to when you want to do those things, right? But for the test, you want to get used to every method. If you knew what kind of method to use, do you know how the method works all the way out? And then you do section 7.5 and you're like, throw me any damn thing. Let me see if I can figure out which method to use. If you don't know how to do a method, I don't care if you can identify it then, you can't do it. So first step is know how to do every method that we've talked about. Uh, and then this whole thing is just um, being used to what you're allowed to do. So, so you guys didn't really know you could do this as often as you really can. But now you do. This is something to try. If you plug stuff in and you still have an X hanging out and you can't figure out how to replace it, then you can't do it this way. You've got to figure out another way to do it. And that's the part of this. You should, 176 is where you should start getting used to this with trig identity proofs. Uh, try something, it didn't work. Let me try something else. And not letting it be like, you know, in your head you feel like I always have to be able to get exactly the right way that's bullshit, right? Math is try something, oh, that led to something gross, let me try something else, right? That's what it really is. So on a test, if you're having a lot of trouble on one of the problems and you try something and it doesn't work, and you try something else, don't erase those, make sure, clear that, you know, put a line through, but at least leave it so I can see what you've done, especially if you're like, I can't figure out what to do, show me what you've tried. It'll tell me that you know what you're doing with those methods, even though maybe they're wrong. Or maybe you made one little mistake that made the whole thing look like it couldn't be done. I give partial credit. 
So I understand how one little mistake on these things makes the whole damn thing undoable. But if you don't show me what you've done, I can't give you any partial credit. You kind of with me? Now, if you figure out the right way to do it, then you can make really clear what the hell I want to look at, right? If you don't know what the hell's going on, you can't figure it out, show me what you've tried so I can see what you've attempted. And then move on. Don't get stuck on a problem. I hate that. They're like, I got stuck on four and never finished any of the other ones. I'm like, shit, don't do that to yourself. Don't be linear in your testing. Anyway, um, okay. Is that cool for the problem? Can you guys finish that off from there? Yeah. You guys, because that now is in here. Integrate it, pull back in what U is, and then plug the limits in. Yeah. Can you just synthetic division on that one? Oh, sure, sure, sure. So, synthetic. How many of you guys know what I mean when I say synthetic division? Holy shit. All right. So, let's focus on that for a second. Because that is really, really useful. Um, so the one we just did is not the best example to start with. So let me, let me well, let's start with that because I got all the work up there. Um, so the really sucky thing about all this work is that these things are stupid. Every time I have something here, don't they just cancel? So if there was just a way that I wouldn't even have to write that in the first place, it would be beautiful. The important work really is, is this stuff here. Right? That's what I want to see. And then why do I keep writing these stupid variables over and over and over again? All that really, really matters is the numbers and how they're going. So I just got to make sure this is in order. And, now this is really quick. If you've never seen synthetic, this is not a good substitute for uh, teaching you synthetic division. But uh, you got to know it exists. Um, notice I, every time I have to change a sign, right? And a lot of mistakes I see is people forgot to change a sign or something, which throws the entire rest of it off. So the, what synthetic division does is, uh, I don't watch a lot of hockey, but I still call this the penalty box. In the penalty box goes, it changes the sign of this right off the bat. It doesn't ever write any variables. So I'm gonna divide by the opposite of negative one. Or you can think about it like the root of u plus one would be negative one. And then I only want to focus on the coefficients. And I want to make sure I got everything represented. So I'm dividing into 3u squared plus 0u plus 0. So I got all the possible terms represented. So here's a beautiful thing. Why did you put a 3 here? Because 1 goes into 3 three times, right? So whatever that number is, that's going to be part of the answer. Uh, this synthetic division assumes that you're dividing by something with a 1 out there. So you pull the 3 down. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Add. That's this step. That's captured there. Negative 1 times negative 3 is 3. Add. That's this step. And then if you started with a squared and you divided by basically a first power, your answer is going to end up being a first power. So these are the coefficients of your answer. So this was 3u squared, so this is now 3u minus 3 plus 3 over what I divided by. That's exactly what we got there. Right? So that's synthetic division. At least you guys know it exists now. If I'm you and I've never seen that before, this I'm going to do it again later because it's going to be very useful forever in mathematics. This is a really useful way to factor stuff. Yeah. Somebody had a hand up. Yeah. How did you get like why why is it and negative one? The way that the, the, truly the reason you can look at it like this is the root of this. U plus one has a root of negative one. But it really actually relates more directly to the fact that I have to change the signs here. So I just change the sign right at the beginning. That really is what's happening. So that's changing the sign right at the beginning, so I never would forget to do so. Maybe, maybe. If you don't like that, you can just always do freaking long division. That always works with the help. But this is really nice and quick. Okay. Anything else from... It's wide open. You're not used to this, I think. But whatever the hell. Homework, practice test, quiz, whatever. Yes?
Oh yeah, good. So when I said the first quadrant, I really meant from like zero to pi over two. So you're, I gotta be more explicit with my, that's a range of, of angles that I wanna use. Because when you're trying to figure out the area bounded by curves, what's the first natural step that helps you figure out the limits you're gonna use? So if I wanna know the area bounded by two rivers, and one river goes here and the other river comes in, what's important is where they meet, exactly. So where do these two functions equal each other? Is the first step, always. You want to figure out, that's going to help you figure out your limits. Because they didn't say the area between these two from x equals 1 to x equals 7. That would be easy. Then I would integrate from 1 to 7. I wouldn't even have to think about it. But I need to figure out where these meet. And that'll be the area contained within that, where, between where they meet. So if I say 1 equals the other one, how do I solve that? Please don't say divide by cosine, because cosine could be zero, and you wouldn't be allowed. Say again? Yeah, so subtract cosine over. Factor, how do you factor that? Cosine. Either way you do it, you get it the same way. Right. So either cosine x is zero, so x would be careful. Not cosine of zero. Cosine of what is zero? Pi over two. And the first quadrant, so like pi over two. How are we doing so far? Is this familiar? This should be pre-calculus kind of stuff. And then of course, or cosine x equals one. So x would be, now you come in with zero, good. Cool, so now I know my limits. I want to integrate from one uh, from zero to pi over two, and the next thing you have to be worried about when you're trying to find the area between two functions, you have to know which function is on top. And from zero to pi over two, actually all over the damn place, cosine is at most one. So when you square a number less than one, it gets gets smaller exactly, right? That's why this, the parabola curves below the y equals x line. I know I'm throwing a lot of shit at you guys, but these are little things you should have picked up by now. When a square number less than one, it's going to get smaller, which means which one of these is going to be bigger? Cosine x. So when I integrate, it's got to be this guy minus this guy because he's on top. So integral from 0 to pi over 2. And now you just got to figure out how to integrate that. So I didn't understand why I think cosine x is going to be on the top. You could do it this way too. If they meet only here and here, pick a number in the middle and see who's bigger. Then that one's going to be bigger for the whole time, right? Because they only meet at the ends. So if I pick pi over 4, what's cosine of pi over 4? Square root of 2 over 2. And what's cosine of pi over 4 squared? One half or one half. Yeah, one half, right? Yeah. Now, what's basically then it comes down to it boils down to what's bigger, one or radical two? Radical two. So this guy's going to be bigger. The the cosine is going to be bigger over the whole region because they meet here and here. I can pick any damn point in here and see which one's bigger. He's going to be bigger the whole damn time because the only time the other one can get bigger is they have to meet first before you can get bigger, right? You guys, that's the quickest way to figure out which one's bigger. Of course, you could just graph them. On your graphic calculator, but I'd much rather have a nice, quick way to figure it out in my head or by hand. Bam, done. You guys got it with me? Because that's the important part. You turn that around, you're going to get a negative answer. In which case, you could just, you know, make it positive. So now, uh, hopefully, we've done this enough. That's easy. This one requires good. The one half, one plus. Beautiful. Kick ass, right? Whenever you see cosine squared or sine squared by themselves, yeah. you could just use that identity to rewrite it. And I'm still seeing way too many people integrate cosine 2x and getting sine 2x or something. 
What's wrong with that? Over two, yeah. So if you already had a one half, then it's going to be over four. Right? It won't kill the one half. It makes the one half stronger, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. So we have all these old situations. You had problems like this way back last semester, right? We found the, the area between two curves. But they were always curves that you end up being able to do the interval of. So if they gave you this in count one, that would have been exceptionally evil because you wouldn't know what the hell to do with it. But now we know what the hell to do with it. Even then, I, I could get away. It's just an identity, right? But now we made it more explicit using an identity there. Is that cool? Is that far enough? You guys could finish that out? Okay, there, see, that's all you got to do. That's all you got to do is, is answer a question. It's crazy. And then things happen. Uh, let's see. So here I've got... Uh, this is going to be easy eventually. This one I replace with... Remember that same idea? Remember, I don't know if you guys remember this, but I always call it cosine the jerk. And it kind of helps you with some of the identities at first, you know, all kind of stuff. So when it's cosine squared, cosine's positive. If it was sine squared, cosine's in here, but it's going to make it negative now because it's, you know, your sine, screw you. I'm going to make it negative. And it's just to help you remember, maybe. Yes? Is there a reason you're changing between x and theta? Uh, yes, because I'm so used to using theta with trig. And then you distribute the one half. And this is where you got to be careful about, like I just said over there, when you integrate cos into x over 2, it's going to now be over 4. Good. So this is going to be sine x minus 1 half x minus 1 fourth sine 2x from 0 to pi over 2. Now notice if I try to plug a 0 in, everything becomes sweet. So I just got to worry about the pi over 2 part, right? So you get... What's sine of pi over 2? 1. 1 minus... Pi over 4, right? One half of pi over 2. Minus 1 fourth. What's sine of twice pi over 2? Good. Sine of pi is 0. So you just get 1 minus pi over 4. So if you're in a situation where there's a lot of little things you've forgotten, or it's been a long time, or you think your teacher never taught you, or whatever, focus on showing me that you understand the material from here. And if you get to a point where you're supposed to plug stuff in, and you've forgotten what the trig of it is, or whatever, then at least write the form of it. You'll get points. I'm going to grade based mostly on the concept of calculus 2. You will lose points if you're not able to do something from earlier. But show me as much as you possibly freaking can. Show me that you understand the methods that I've taught in this class. So if nobody's asking anything, it's it's your floor. Yeah. Where's he got this here?
All right, so what did somebody try? There's a really nifty little thing you could do here, but I want to see. What, 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 what do you always kind of rule out first? What do, you, what do you always start with and hope to God it might be this? Jesus. And it's obviously not. If you make U equal the bottom, it's not, it's not going to be a direct U sub. But I'll give you a little hint. It is somehow related to U sub as a decent first step. Now, there might be some other way to do it that I haven't even thought of. Yeah? Use partial fractions. How would you? So use partial fractions, I have to be able to factor the bottom out simply. And if I try to factor the bottom, I would get remarkably disgusting, irrational, complex stuff. Don't want to. That's not a bad way to go because it's obviously rational. So partial fractions is a good idea to have, but you quickly rule that out too. Right? Good. I love it. So if you see it's rational, first thing U sub, direct U sub won't work because the, the top is not the derivative of the bottom. That oh shit, it sucks. Uh, all right. So that it's rational. So maybe a partial fractions, but you can't even break that down really. So that doesn't go anywhere. How would you cancel? Got to be careful. If this turned around, then I could cancel some stuff out, right? Good, good, good. What, what's really kind of gross about the bottom here is the fact that it's got the fourth power. And the top is the derivative of x squared, basically, right? Minus a 2. And we never care about constants. We can make those show up. So if I make one little uh, sub u equal x squared, Which is another kind of thing about the the the, rate, the flexibility of u sub. I can let u equal x a piece of something. By parts, I can never do that. But u sub could be a piece of something. Then what's du? So then I need to introduce yeah two there. So I want a one half there. Cool. And I'll tell you this real quick. I'm not going to take a lot of points off for this, but this kind of thing would would really add up. Some of you guys in the homework have noticed you're just not being careful enough. You're trying to go too quickly and trying to get to X from you or something. Or, or uh, you'll put a 2 out here just because you didn't stop and think, I need a 2 inside, so I need a 1 half out front. So those kind of errors, they won't be by themselves major points off. But if you do that everywhere, it'll add up. So it's bookkeeping that a lot of you guys are failing on, right? Just not being careful with making sure everything goes in the right place. Uh, so what happens here now? We get 2x dx is du. x squared is u. x to the fourth is u. Now what does that look like I, I want to try? I heard it. Second. Because you eventually want to use I want you to realize completing the square would never let you use partial fractions because completing the square is not truly factoring something. You'll have something squared plus, oh crap, plus, not factored. So you can never go from completing the square to partial fractions. You're not really factoring the bottom. You're putting the bottom in a certain form so that I can use trig, enough, trig sub, right? Trigonometric substitution. Uh, and, you know, you're in Calc 2, so you should get over the, the uh, well, there's not a 4 there, so they didn't make it 9. It's too damn bad, right? You know the, you know the steps. Man, that could be a real answer. You know the steps. Uh, you know the steps. So they don't have to give you nice stuff. So u squared plus u, what has to go in there? Are you guys with this? Why, why do I have to do trick stuff? Another u sub kind of thing is definitely not going to give me a damn place. Uh, I, can't, I still can't use partial fractions just because that simple substitution, this is still the same form. It's not going to be factorable, right? So that really, trig sub is all I can really do, and this is just not the right form yet, and that's why we're completing the square. So I get it more in that x squared plus a squared form, right? So what's going to have to go here? Yeah, half of one is one half squared is one fourth. So out here I got to put minus one fourth. Cool. So what do you get here? Minus one fourth. 
Careful. Plus three fourths. Right? That's all under. Finish this out. Um, so now it's in the right form, believe it or not. All the numbers are going to be gross as hell. Oh well. They're not going to be as gross as they could be. Um, but what does x squared plus a squared require? What kind of substitution? Tangent for the plus is tangent. For the 1 minus, that's sign, right? And for the x first, that's secant. Good. So we're all kind of moving in the direction of knowing when to do what. Plus is the easy one. Let plus be. Plus looks like a T. Yay, tangent. Um, so here I'm going to want to let this, you, put it up here. I want to let u plus one half equal, here's my a squared. So what's a? Oh, sorry, you think you just said. Thank you. You're like, I just told you, Jeff. Root 3 over 2 times what? Which trig? Tangent. So then du, because a constant dies, equals root 3 over 2 secant squared. Now, the next big mistake I see people making is you're just putting d theta in place of dx or du. du is all that d theta. And very often, that piece will help you cancel stuff out in the other piece. And if you leave that piece off, you end up in really disgusting places. Right? So straight up substitute. Uh, here I have 1 half integral, 1 over. What's this? It's that thing squared, right? So it'll be 3 fourths tan squared theta plus 3 fourths, right? So far, so good? Just direct substitution. We, we said u plus 1 half was that, so u plus 1 half squared is the square of that. Yes, ma'am? Where do you get root 3 over 2? It's always. Uh, x equals, in this case, it would be x equals a tangent theta. a squared is what's here, so a is the square root of it. a squared is 3 fourths, so square root of 3 over 2, yeah, 4. So don't think you're wrong just because this is not 9. It doesn't have to be 9. It could be any damn thing. It could be 11.7. Okay. Um, and then what do I put here? Yeah, this whole thing. i got to replace du with what it is. Something very nice happens very soon. Cool. All right. So if I pull three fourths out, how's it going to show up out here? Four thirds, because it's on the bottom. You got to do the reciprocal, right? So little things like that also kill us. So I'll get two thirds. Right, because it would be four thirds out here. One over tan squared theta plus one is secant squared theta. I can pull the root three over two out also, right? Is that cool? And then I can reduce that stuff. You guys doing okay? So now it's cleanup time. Yes? Uh, I had a question. So when you made A equal square root three over two, why didn't you use the one half? That's going to U plus one half. Because this is acting like oh, X. X squared. Okay. Yeah. I could let u plus 1 half equal m, and then du equals dm. But I really want you to see why that substitution is completely unnecessary. This whole thing becomes a whatever, a sine, a tan, in this case, a tangent. But if you want to, you certainly could do a, an m sub here. Right here. I did u, I got the m sub. And just to make this look nicer, there's nothing wrong with that. When you do a sub for a linear piece, 
it's just really going to make this the form stay the same. It's just going to make it look better. I don't need to do that. Yes? Are you going from one half to two thirds on the outside? Because uh, we took a three fourths out and it becomes four thirds, of course, because divided by three fourths is multiplied by four thirds. And then. Cool. And I still, so I took that out, right? Took that out. So I have a secant squared theta d theta, so the secant squares cancel. So I get root 3 over 3 integral 1 d theta. Let me just stop right there. This problem gets people down because you have trouble keeping track of the numbers. And for some reason, I think it's getting less and less understood how fractions on the bottom work. You just take them back up top and reciprocate them. That's how you divide by fractions. And then, of course, that's yeah, so root 3 over 3 theta. And now I just got to figure out what theta is. And that's whenever we get theta somewhere at the end of time, that's nice. Because we said uh, u plus 1 half equal this. So theta would equal 2 root 3 times that inverse tangent of it. Right? Just got to solve for theta. So if I gave you this as a problem in itself and said solve for theta, you should all go, oh, thank God, give me more of those if it's all for theta. Right. So here theta is uh, inverse tangent of 2 over root 3 times u plus 1 half. Yummy. So that's one level of dominoes, right? I'm falling back now. Set my dominoes up whenever I make a substitution. Now I've got to fall back. Theta falls back into u, and u is going to have to fall back into x. So now this is root 3 over 3 inverse tangent of stuff. And then u is x squared. Yummy, yummy. I'll see That was painful. <laughs> this is kind of long. I obviously can't give you like seven of these kind of problems on the, on, the, on the test. I'll tell you this, just to ease your minds a little tiny bit. I will have one section on the test where I'll say part A, use by parts. Part B, use this. You with me? So there you can showcase that you know each method. And then the next section I'm going to have integrate the following. <laughs> right? So that's where you have, that's like section 7.5. You have to figure out for yourself what method to use. Okay. So if you know the methods, but you're really bad about figuring out when to use them, you'll at least have one section where you just totally just beat it up. And the next section, you just do what you can. OK, anything else from? Let me do this. Let me give you guys the answer key. I always wait a little bit, because normally when I give this out, I lose. Uh, did you get to see squared after you put the Oh, because I'm left with tangent squared plus one? Oh, plus one. So obviously on number one, there's a lot of different ways to get to the end. I like doing the substitute something in for x first and then take me as far as I can. It's coming. Is there enough? Uno más. Okay.
Couldn't count right on two rows and they cancel each other out. So number one, there's more than one way to get to the end. So whatever way you like best, except just plug it in your calculator. Uh, 2D is that one that was like the, the cube root of x one we did earlier. There are other ways to do that problem, but that's the way that I first thought of. So that's the way I did it. Two F is kind of funky. I, I'm going to try not to do. Uh, I can't promise you this, but sometimes with two F, there's just a realization of how you can rewrite a piece of it, so that so that it'll flow into the rest of it. So that one you had cosine two X. If you rewrite that a certain way, you can factor that. So cosine two X is cosine squared minus sine squared. Difference of squares. You can factor it. You can pull over part of it. So if that's one of those where if you just don't think about that, you won't be able to do anything, which in a way is unfair. So I'm going to try not to do that too often. But I can't promise you that much. You just got to think about all the ways you can use identities on a problem. And cosine 2x is that one that has like three different ways to rewrite it. Right? Oh. Um, average value of a function is something from... Calc one. Um, in fact, how do you take the average of anything? Yeah, so if I wanted the average x, I would add up x and divide by how many there are. Right? So if I want the average of a function, a function is different from a list of numbers because it's it's continuous, not discrete. So I can't use the sum, I've got to use its calculus equivalent, which is the integral, right? This is a big ass S to replace the Greek S. So to average the F, I would add up the F values and divide it by how many there are. So if I'm going from A to B, there's B minus A of them. Add up the values, divide it by how far they go. It's the same definition for a list of numbers and a continuous function outputs. Holy shit. So that's what I did there. And that relates actually to that root mean square electrical current problem in the homework. Do you be willing to do that one? Huh? Can you do the electrical current one? Uh, yeah, sure. Which section was that in? Do you remember? Yes, cool. All right, so I got a request to do 72 number 66. That's the electrical current one. And a lot of us just kind of wrote 66 down and left it all blank when you took the home. <laughs> or you wrote down something. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, 66 is difficult because there's a lot packed very quickly in there. It says 60 cycles per second. And then they say you want to integrate over one cycle. So from that, you figure out your limits. But it's really easy to just read over that and go, I don't even know what the hell to integrate over. Right? So you kind of miss it. So if it's 60 cycles in a second, and I want to integrate over one cycle, yeah, 1 60th of a second. So I know that I want to integrate from 0 to 1 60th. That's what my time is going to go from to. And then they define for me what root mean square is. It's the square root of the average value of the square of the voltage, right? That's why I thought it was correct because it's E. I should use a B. What's that? Oh, this is number 6672. So the square, I got to first average the square of the voltage. I forgot how to freaking make it E. Yep, cool. Over one cycle. So I've got to square the voltage, find the average. So what, what am I missing for the average? This has got to be divided by, zero. sum it up, divided by 160th minus zero. 
So this piece inside the radical is the average squared voltage. And then I square root it to kill the squares. Of course, that doesn't actually cancel perfectly. That's why this is not exactly sort of like related to statistics if you've taken that and you square root the variance. Uh, so what's this look like? Let's just focus on the inside here. So I get 60 times the integral. That squared would just be whatever the hell 155 squared is times sine squared 120 pi c. You just stop right there. Is it cool? So I'm not going to draw the big ass square root. At the end, we got to take a square root. So I understand a lot of you guys weren't sure how to set this up because, like I said, there's a lot you can look over and just miss as you're reading it. You know, like they didn't tell me this, they didn't tell me that. They did. They said it really quickly. Uh, and how do I integrate this kind of thing? Exactly. I got to rewrite it using the identity. It's a square. There's no cosine pieces to let me do a u sub. Oh, uh, 155, because this had a 155. It's 155 squared. Because, yeah. And the other one, that sine squared. And the number was inside the square. Inside the square. It's 120? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So now I would rewrite the inside. So I rewrite that as a 1 minus 1 half. Yeah, let me put the over 2 out here. So it's saying twice this whole thing. Right, that's the sine squared of something is 1 minus cosine twice that thing, right? Over 2. Okay, cool. And then now this is relatively easy to integrate if you're careful with the stuff inside here. So I get this, so I get 30 times 155 squared, whatever that is. Integral of 1 is t. This is dt. Integral of cosine Yeah, so, so the integral of cosine is sine And here inside I got 240 pi t, is that cool? Over Well, over 240 pi You guys see that part? If I integrate cosine ax dx, what will that be? Sine ax over a. Why is that over a there? To kill the a that would come out, right? I desperately want you. So much of the integration processes we use are just because of that stupid fact. If I differentiate this, I better get this. Well, if I differentiate this, an a comes out. Let me kill it. Okay, I'm good. I really want you to understand that's all there is behind a lot of the stuff we do with integration. If the inside is not linear, it's a lot more difficult. You have to do some more stuff. If the inside is linear, it should be very simple to integrate. So here, my, my A is 240 pi. That's what's in front of my variable, right? So I got to divide that by 240 pi because that would pop out. That's a different uh, derivative. From zero. 160th. So now you just got to plug those values in. A bunch of ugly big numbers and stuff. Right? And then the last thing, whenever you get a number, you the last thing you do is take a square root. Right? So you got to do that big ass square root. The coefficients anywhere shouldn't bother any of us. You just have to take care of them. You have to be careful with them, but they don't change the fundamental integrals or the derivatives. 
You're just going to come for the ride in one way or another. Most of you guys still don't believe me, is there? Yeah. Is that cool for that one? I mean, I don't want to plug crap. You just plug 160th in. When you plug a zero in, what sign of zero? So you don't have to worry about the zero piece, right? Plug a 160th and a 160th. 240 divided by 60 is 4. Sine of 4 pi is 0. Zero, yes. So then you don't have to worry. Right? Trust. Okay. Where did, uh, where did we get the coefficients uh, out front? To be oh, here. By, divided by 2. The one about that. Where did we get the... the... The 60 is from divided by 160th, which is the average piece, right? Yeah. Uh, the 155 was a piece of what the E was. The e and then the over 2 was because when I replaced this, is one half this. One half. So I just pulled a one half out. Yeah. Cool, okay. So where are we on your next? Did I, somebody? Number 61? Oh, sweet, darn. Rotation problem, I love. Let me leave that up there. So 61, 7.2. Find the volume obtained by rotating the region. Oh yeah, you thought that was behind you. Uh, rotating the region bounded by the given curve is about the specified axis. Okay, so 61 says uh, I've got sine x and zero, uh, and x is from pi over two. about the x-axis. Okay. So x is from pi over 2 to pi. Uh, I want to go between, and y equals zero is of course another name for the x-axis, I like it, cool, you can do it like this, I can work with that. So y equals zero is the x-axis, that's one of the boundaries, I'm going to rotate it around the x-axis, sure. So I want, uh, and sine x of course at pi over two it's one, and at pi it's zero. So then I have this region here is captured by this, bam, this, bam, and these. So it's this area there. All right, so it's the region captured by all those things. They really didn't have to say this because that would have told me to stop there. Anyway, they did. Great. So if I want to rotate this around the x-axis, I don't know how you guys, how your teachers taught you uh, washers versus uh, yes, cylinders, yes, right? Yes. And of course, I always call it, there's discs and cylinders. Washers is just subtracting a, a disc from another disc, right? Oh boy. So if I'm gonna rotate around the x-axis, then which method do I wanna use? Yeah, because if I wanna rotate around the x-axis and I use the disc method, <coughs> Then it's going to be integral. Say again. So remember, I'm doing the. Say again. All right, good. So the, I'm going to have the radius of a disk is going to be uh, sine x minus zero. Cool. So the basic idea, and is this going to be, if you want it to, a disc or a washer, it's definitely going to be a, if you want to make a distinction between the two, and I know a lot of you guys are like, dude, this is a long time ago, leave me alone. 
but this is going to be a disc because there's no hollow part. It hugs the axis it's rotating around. There's no hollow part. The whole thing with washers is you have a hollow center. All right, so here I just got to worry about pi r squared. But it's going to be d. How do I locate my discs? Here's one disc here. If I want another disc, where do I move? Up and down or left and right? Left and right. If I want to draw another disc, wouldn't it be here? Or another disc, wouldn't it be here? So I locate them as they move along the x axis, right? So pi r squared, because that's the area of a circle. Because I'm going to rotate this thing around. It's going to make a whole bunch of little circles. I'm going to add all those circles areas together, and of course it's going to end up being the volume. So if I stack a bunch of records, or, you know, that's a long time ago. If I stack a bunch of DVDs, then I can add the areas, and I basically get the volume that they go through if I stack up a whole bunch of them, right? That's the idea. I'm going to add up all the areas as I move through this region. And how do I move through it? Along the x-axis. So I got pi integral. What's my radius? You guys already just told me. George, you told me that. Sine x minus zero, yeah. So sine x. There you go. So the hard part about the problem was setting it up. And now we've seen enough sine squared stuff to know how to attack that. You rewrite that with the identity. So this is uh, stuff that you did in Calc 1, hopefully. Although now I've lost, I've lost some uh, faith in some Calc 1 teachers because of, I don't know, or you guys have just forgotten. It's one of those two things. Uh, so hopefully everybody at least talked about this kind of stuff before. Uh, and the reason I want to bring it up now is you can do the whole thing, but now you've got this, which you would not have been able to do in Calc 1, but you can do it now. You would have been able to, but oh, yes. So if I draw this again real quick, just make it look a little better. Pick a, pick a, a disc. What is the radius? It's that distance, right? Because how tall is that, this function, that function is? Cool. If I would have rotated about y equals negative 1, it would have been 1 plus sine x, right? You just think how far away is it from the center out? Coolness. If you want to use shelves, you'd have to actually use the inverse sign. I don't want to do that because then you'd have to have a dy. Okay, that's enough of that. Right, you guys can finish that, right? I mean, that's sine squared, replace it with 1 minus cosine 2x over 2. We've done a lot of those, yeah. 42 on the same side. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good. Um, every now and again in the homework, we've seen this a few times. I'll give you something I really didn't even talk about in lecture, uh, just because it's in the reading. So I, it, sometimes it's me trying to force you guys to go back and read and look at examples. And sometimes I just forget to go over something. Uh, but this one is definitely on purpose, 42. So you have identities on that previous page. And they tell you that cosine of something times cosine of something else can be rewritten as it's plus. Yep. Cool. Now, I hope to God you understand. I do not have every mathematical fact memorized. I would probably explode. Anybody would, unless they have some kind of freaky ass memory. Uh, so there are certain things I don't make you memorize. Basically, anything I don't make you memorize are things that I haven't memorized myself. And they're normally things that I could figure out if I needed it. Set up the interval and do it. I don't have to memorize it. So this comes from these two written out, added together, cut in half and make this. So if you replace the subtraction and the addition uh, identities here, added them together and cut it in half, you would get this. That kind of makes sense, because what would be the first piece of this? Cosine A, cosine B, right? Minus sine A, sine B. This would be cosine A, cosine B, 
plus sine x. And the sines would cancel, and you get two cosine a, cosine b, cut in half is one cosine a, cosine b. Ooh. So it's, on one level, it's kind of like, okay, yay, you can play around with freaking anything. But now it tells you how to integrate cosine, cosine when the interiors are not the same. In general, that's really disgusting. If your interiors aren't the same, they don't play together well. You have to figure out how to rewrite them. But this is telling you, no, you don't have to rewrite them. You can rewrite the whole thing. So in this case, what would it be? One half cosine of... Yeah, one minus four, negative three, and then plus cosine of one plus four, This is uh, 7, 2. Yeah. Does that make sense? Is that cool? So that problem, it was only hard because I didn't talk about it. But it's not hard when you realize it's just a substitution using an identity. And now this becomes something very simple to integrate <laughs> both of those, right? Just, get, just like the one we just did, you got to be careful with that 3 pi. It's got to show up in the integral underneath. And real quick, what kind of function is cosine? What kind of symmetry does cosine have? Starting at the at the y-axis, can you draw out cosine for me? What's it look like? Kind of go in both directions. Does it look like that? So isn't it sort of like a parabola? I like that. It's got even symmetry, which means cosine of negative x is the same thing as cosine of x. You guys with me? So that's why, and you notice if I would have put that first, wouldn't this have been a positive three? So I would probably do that. But here, cosine of negative something is the same as cosine of that thing. So you could just replace this with positive three pi x because of the properties of cosine. Sine of negative x is negative sine of x because sine is an odd function. Okay, maybe. Let's just explain some of you guys. I kind of circled some negatives on your homework. And that's why you could do more with it. Yeah. Simple problem like this if we don't remember the identities. So, oh, I, I would. So I want you, please, dear God, please. I would not give you this. Just this and say integrate this. I mean, that would be so remarkably evil. I'm not going to make you memorize this, right? My reason for assigning this in the homework is just to show you that other identities come together and create something that you can integrate other forms. So I showed you that big red book. Remember that last time? I think I even showed you a little bit what's inside of it. There are so many integral forms, it's impossible to learn all of them. So you start to learn basic procedures to use on some of them, and then you try to expand on those. There's no way in hell that anybody will ever learn every single possible one. So it's difficult for a student to understand. But, you know, we do what we can. So me, I'm going to be very specific. There are very specific ways you got to know. I'm not going to make you memorize stuff like that. It's really not generously useful. right? You don't hit these kind of things a lot. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, let's see, this one looks yummy. So several people I've seen in my office have, uh, they just love this problem. I don't blame you. This is not a pretty problem. 
it shows you, see on the one hand, I taught you guys these things here, right? That's, that's great. But the more important thing than just memorizing these is you realize what the hell it's trying to do. The whole thing with the A is it's trying to make the coefficient of the x squared piece and the, co and the constant the same, because then you can pull them out, right? So if you let x equal 3 something, it's never going to get you any damn work, because you're going to end up with 27 and a 1. They're not the same. And, and why am I doing trig sub on this problem? Not just because I can, because there are a lot of problems I can do trig sub on that I, I could just do a u sub on. But u sub would never get me anywhere. Right? There's, no, no, there's nothing up top. U equals that. It's not going to get me anywhere. Kind of with me? It's got a radical, so it's definitely not partial fractions because it only works on ratios of polynomials. No. We'll leave it like that right now. You guys kind of with me? So again, I'm trying to show you how to identify a problem. So when you see radical and you see squares, I mean, that's, that's a screaming trig sub. You, you rule out U sub. Well, U sub's not going to go any damn where. Let me attack it with trig sub. So what do I want to let x equal? Which trick function am I going to use? Secant, because it's function minus 1. That's secant squared minus 1 is tangent squared. So I know I'm going to use secant. If it's a plus, that's tangent. If it's 1 minus or some minus x squared, that's sine. Kick ass. So I definitely want to make it equal secant theta. What number do I put in front? And you could either, you could pull a, a, a you could put a radical 9 out. Which means what would be left here? One over, one over nine. And then that would be a squared. Or you just realize the whole purpose of a is to kill this, is to make these the same. So if I make it a one third, squared is one ninth, kills the nine, makes them both one. Okay, so either way you want to do it, it's going to end up with one third there. So what's dx? One third secant theta tangent theta. Okay, and then we've got. So what do we got here? We got. Uh, well, I have two dx's running around. So I got dx is this. I've got x to the fifth would be one third secant theta to the fifth power, right? And then this will be square root of, well, sort of. Uh, so I'm going to put the one third secant, so that would be one ninth secant squared, so that's secant squared theta minus one. Right, you guys see all see that? Once I play one third secant squared, one third squared is nine. One ninth kills the nine, leaves the secant squared behind, and now this is ready to go for an identity. If those coefficients are not the same, the identity can't directly be used. Sorry. Good. So this this becomes tangent. So I get two thirds. Now, now the big problem, the next problem in this problem is just keeping track of what everything does. So this is tangent that kills that. What else happens here? Yeah, one of the secants. So I have four secants left here, right? If I take a one third out and I divide it by five one thirds, I end up with one over four one thirds, which is four threes. Oh shit, let me say it again. One third to the fifth would be three to the fifth on the outside, right? Divided by three is three to the fourth there. That's a better way to say it. One third to the fifth would be three to the fifth on the outside. Reciprocate it. Take the one third out, kills one of the threes, and I get four threes left. So it's that bookkeeping on the numbers very often kills us. But I'm going to grade a lot more on the functions. Coefficients you got to be careful about, but I'm not going to kill you if you do something silly with them. And of course, this is, of course, I should put those like that. Yeah, cosine 
Beautiful. What's up? Sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah, so one over secant cosine. You got four of them. And then how do you handle that? Yeah, so you got cosine squared squared, right? So you have the identity squared. Foil that bad boy. Oh. So you get uh, 81. I just got, I don't want to get tired writing those limits. Uh, cosine squared squared. You get 81. Uh, 1 plus cosine 2 theta over. The whole thing over 2, Jeff. Squared. Is that cool? What's up? You guys with me? No? If you, don't tell me the, if you don't tell me the minute that I lose you, it's bad things. Yeah. It's good. Okay. And then, like, a one half squared I can take out, so I get 81 over 4. And then if I foil this, what do I get? What do I have to do for that? Oh, yeah. Then anything again. So whenever you get a cosine or sine squared, you can you pretty much have to replace it with the identity. If there's no sign running around to use as a du. You guys kind of, so of course, a lot of us make little mistakes. A lot of us get here and go, eh, it's been long enough. <laughs> go to the next problem, right? So you need stamina to get through some of these problems. So I, I can replace, so I got one plus two cosine two theta plus Cosine squared two theta would be good. Cosine four theta over its own two. And and now that should be relatively easy to integrate, believe it or not. So to integrate that, I will get Integral this is one is theta. Integral of two cosine two theta is good. Sine two theta, I love it. Because the two is there. So it, everything's great. Plus one half theta plus one over eight. Good, sine four theta over eight, because the four would have to be there with the two to make eight. Oops, and this is a definite integral from in parentheses for me, because I never did change the limits, right? If you think this is a long problem, it's not. And now I can take it back to x. x is 1 third secant theta. So I know what theta is. Sine 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. Now I can figure out what sine theta and cosine theta are from the triangle I can make, right? Oh, so much. So, so how, <laughs> what's the triangle I can make from this? So I get secant theta equals 3x, right? 3x over 1. So what triangle can I make? What side's going to be 3x? Hypotenuse, what side's going to be 1? Bless you. Thank you. Yes, cool. And of course, this side is going to be, remarkably enough, 9x squared minus 1. Basically, almost always happens. Yeah, it has to always happen. So now I can identify what the pieces are. Theta, I can get directly from this inverse secant of 3x, right? Sine 
sine two theta is two sine theta cosine theta. What's sine theta? Uh, nine Careful. Nine root nine x squared over three x, yeah? So root nine minus x squared over three x. And what's cosine theta? One over three x. So that's sine two theta, right? It's two sine theta cosine theta. That's an identity you can use for that double angle. Plus, then what about sine 4 theta? 4 sine 2 sine 2 theta. Yeah, it's 2 sine 2 theta. Sine 2 theta is this whole thing. Times cosine 2 theta all over 8, right? So the really nice thing is once you know what sine 2 theta is, you can get cosine 2 theta directly from the identity, right? It would be square root of 1 minus sine squared if you want to. Or you can rewrite cosine 2 theta as cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Plug those values in, because we already know what cosine and sine of theta are. Right? So again, what's important is uh, you know when to use identities. The last step in one of these trig sub problems will pretty much always involve that triangle, or you can use the identities. You, you, you could actually just never draw the damn triangle and just use all the identities directly. I just prefer to make the triangle it's just so much easier to me. You have to have one way or the other. Any of what I just did doesn't make sense. Why didn't you ask me while I was doing it? You, you can still ask. It's not over. Yes. Yeah, I know, I know. So this piece I gotta still continue okay. Okay. rewriting. It still is true. Yeah, yeah. I just haven't gotten it all the way to X yet. So the sine two theta or cosine two theta? No, no, no. Sine of two times something mm -hmm. is twice sine that thing to cosine that thing. So this is sine of twice two theta. Is two sine two theta cosine two theta. So that two on the outside is not dependent on what's in there. It's just a part of the form of the identity. Not, you know, I'm still not done. You could do any of the, this whole thing is uh, this. This I can get a couple different ways. And then I have to plug in my limits. So this is a very, uh, this is a training problem. This is when you put your, train, your cross training shoes on, get ready. Stamina, get your water, right? You've got to make it all the way through this damn thing as long as hell. I'm still not done because I still have to plug my limits in, right? So, so here I get uh, twice square root of 9 minus x squared over 9x squared, right? That's what sine 2 theta is. Bang. So I put that there. Cosine 2 theta, there's a couple different ways I can make that. I could do one minus the square of this, square root of that to get cosine two theta, because that's how they relate, if you want to, you with me? Or like I said, you could rewrite this as cosine squared minus sine squared, and you know what cosine is and you know what sine is. Either way you want to. And then you start plugging in, uh, Square root of 2 over 3 and 2 thirds. And believe it or not, they are all something that you can, I think they're all, the, this inverse secant, you can certainly figure out what the actual angle is. You shouldn't have to resort to decimals. So, what you want to do when you have a problem like this and you're watching it happen <coughs> is you want to say to yourself, can I do the process he just did? Can, can you do this? All right. Can you simplify this? You just got to be more careful. Some of you guys got to be a little more careful than you have been. Because if you don't simplify this direct correctly, you could end up with an interval you just can't do. If you, you don't put the whole d theta up there, something doesn't cancel, and you end up with something that might be almost impossible. And then you spend a lot of time on it, and that's, oh, oh well. Uh, can you, this identity, we've done it a lot. You foil that bad boy out. Can you do the triangle procedure? Can you do that? 
Does it make sense? I have to do that when it thetas, I gotta bring it back to x's. Right? And then from here, this is just a really nice, beautiful one. You gotta be careful with using identities to base it on stuff that you know, so you can rewrite it in terms of x. And the last step is just plug the stuff in, plug your values in. So don't get, this problem had like almost everything in it. So what you want to do as a student is just say, do I know how to do everything that happened in that problem? And if your problem is you get tired halfway through, that's almost good because you can just fight that. On a test, who cares if you're tired? You got to get it done so you don't lose stupid points on something you could have done, right? That's a little bit of good motivation to get you through. But if you're, if you're hitting snags and you're just like, well, you know, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know how to do that stuff. That's when you come see me. It's when you go see a tutor. That's when you go firm up what it is you don't know. You need to identify for yourself what it is you don't know or what it is uh, you do know. You just don't know when to do it. Or do you just not want to do it? Well, that's, you know, that's your own thing. You take care of that. You're here for some reason, I think. I don't know why you take out to just, oh yeah, I feel like taking count too. I think most of you should be here for a reason. Anything else from homework or practice test? Still wide open? Or do you want to, I mean, when we focus too much on a specific problem, you start to feel a little bit defeated because that specific problem, this problem was a very much one of the uglier problems in the homework, obviously. So this is not, if somewhere near you made a mistake, it could very well make the rest of it almost impossible to do, and there's nothing more frustrating than that. But that's the point where you just got to let it go yourself. You go, all right, that wasn't, I made a mistake, made it impossible. I, you know, don't allow yourself to feel like you're losing faith in the whole process. Do you know how to apply the process? Can you show me that you know how? And I will catch stupid little mistakes. If you get somewhere and you're like, I just really don't know what to do. You show me a few things you tried. I'll say, oh, you made a little mistake there. You're not going to lose a lot of points. You lose a lot more points when you, when you can't show me you know how to do something. Yes, sir. Thirty-nine. Oh yeah, that looks spruce. So we tend to not like problems like this, and I don't blame you when they have like no numbers in them. So they tell you straight up, they tell you, use trig substitution. <laughs> so what trig sub would you use on this problem? Sine. Yeah, sine, because it's like constant minus function squared. One minus sine squared. So you'll let t equal, yeah, so here it's a squared. So it's just the, like the straight up definition I'm going to use. Because that's what I have in there is a. So then how does this work here? So we get a squared minus And of course what's dt? A cosine theta. Yeah, a cosine theta, d theta. I need to replace that and to replace that. Cool. Bless you. So I think because of that, because so many of these uh, processes we learn in Calc 2 are so much more dependent on this guy than you're used to. Some of you guys write the integral, don't even write this down. 
Because in Calc 1, it might have seemed like it's not necessary. Now you start to realize that is so stupid necessary. I have too many people do something like this. I'm not picking on anybody specifically. What's wrong with that? How could that not possibly be true? What's wrong with this? What's probably here? D U. So this should have been U. So you'll make the mistake and not realize you're supposed to be a U. If you think it's already an X and you make that into X, you're wrong. It should have been a U there. It needs to be brought back to X, right? So it told, you need to tell yourself what the hell it is. And if you're not careful, you'll forget you need it and you won't even put this there. Because you don't even have that there. So, I mean, this D something is so stupid important. Okay. Um, so now I get here. This whole thing simplifies to what? A, a, a can come out as a cool. I'm actually, an A squared. Is that all right? From there and there. And then I'll be left with 1 minus sine squared, which is cosine oh, squared square root. And actually, cosine times cosine. And this one we've done a billion and three times, <coughs> roughly. I lost my little limits. So then I do the one or two. So I get a squared times one half theta plus over four. Good. From zero to x. Now bring back in what theta is in terms of x, or in terms of t, you guess. Yeah. Oh, I took an a out of here and that a together. Yeah. So that a and this a came out. So the triangle I can make from this, sine theta equals t over a. So that would be t over a. So this side would be a squared minus t squared. So now I can do this. This is down here, right? Sine 2 theta would be 2 sine theta cosine theta. I can figure out what cosine theta. I know what sine theta is. That kicks ass. <coughs> At one half a squared theta would be inverse sine t over a plus two times sine theta cosine theta over four sine theta is t over a. Yeah. 